I am very fortunate that I have this job, the ability to drive new cars, talk directly to these manufacturers, get their side of the story, and learn how cars that me and you drive every day are created. I get to know the story behind the story, but oftentimes in this position, when we're dealing with a new product launch, so much of the truth is obscured by PR. And we love our PR friends in the industry, and they do a great job of pitching products, but at the end of the day, it's their job to make a product look good and showcase the benefits over its competition. Competition. And oftentimes, it's not till much later we understand the full story behind a product and why it is what it is. And in this video, I'm going to tell you the sad story behind the Dodge Dart and how this vehicle, when it was new, had some really neat features and some really cool gadgets and gizmos that should have made it competitive, but why it turned out to really not be very good. Hey folks, today's video is brought to you by salvagereseller.com. This website allows you to bid live on online salvage auto auctions without a dealer's license. You can register for free or use the 20% off coupon in the description below. Go find your salvage car gem now. And I actually had the chance to talk to the chief designer behind the Dodge Dart, their small affordable car, which was pitched as being super fun to drive and essentially an American Alfa Romeo. What it turned out to be was not much of a success. It had a short model run, and now it's the name's been completely discontinued. And I'm going to tell you that story of exactly what happened with this car. So, Brendan, why don't we start in the front here and talk about the roots of this car? So, if you fast forward to the late 2000s, um, America was in the midst of the financial crisis. Ultimately, Chrysler had to be bailed out, very famously. Now, of course, I knew that. I think a lot of you knew that. But one of the interesting stories that he told me behind this car is one of the stipulations of receiving the government bailout is that Chrysler had to create a small, affordable car that everyone could afford. It was supposed to be like a people's car. And you're probably thinking, that makes sense. That's a good idea. The government just bailed you out. You don't want to take that bailout money and just only build expensive stuff that people you know, can't afford. But the government got their fingers deep into the pot over at Chrysler and started pulling strings and making decisions. And that was one of the big decisions is that they needed an affordable people's car. And you're probably thinking, great. Well, that would take in a typical product cycle five, eight years to develop. The government said, no, we need this car now. We've gone ahead, we've bailed you out of bankruptcy, we need this car now. So essentially, you know, when you start looking at a car, you start thinking about its place in the market, how it can fit in, how you can have a competitive advantage, and then you start looking at the design, and typically uh, you've got a design team that comes together and starts sketching it out. Well, what the designer told me of this car is, he came up with a sketch, and basically they said, build it. You have to build it. The, 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 the whole point of this car was to get this thing out of the door as quickly and as affordably as possible. So, so much of this car was rushed. Now, that isn't to say there weren't other factors involved. There were, of course, designers that worked on this car and put a lot of effort and a lot of love into it. But the turnaround was quicker than just about any other car that has come since the Dodge Dart because the government was so adamant on getting this car out the door fast. Now, I actually think from a design standpoint, they did a pretty knockout job on this vehicle. When you consider it competes against like the Corolla and the Civic, and especially the Corolla and Civic of like 2012 when this car debuted, it was pretty attractive. You've got, you know, the iconic crosshair grille in the front. You've got these kind of aggressive headlights. If you come over to the side here, Brendan, um, one of the cool things about the Dart is they had fun additions like the Rally Edition, cool stripes down the side, and then in the rear, they kept the iconic Dodge, um, uh, uh, trademarked um, racetrack tail light, you know, this, this long continuous light bar that outlines the tail lights that kind of look like a racetrack. And then, um, you know, like I said, there's all sorts of fun things you could have had with this car to spruce it up and make it cool. And then, um, once the engineering was done, once the car was finalized, it was up to the marketing team and the PR team to market this car as something a little bit unusual. So they really marketed this car as being an American Alfa Romeo, right? They wanted to, to pitch that this car was based on the Alfa Romeo. I think it was the Giulietta at the time. Um, and had roots in Alfa Romeo. Ultimately, what that created, though, was this hope that it was going to be really fast and sporty and fun to drive. And then when journalists got behind the wheel, we all realized it's not great, actually. It's kind of wobbly and slow and just not, not very dynamic at all. 
Um, and then the marketing team had some fun ideas too. Like one of the cool things you could do about this car, Brendan, if you want to come back to the front, is you could kind of finance this car through like a crowdfunding campaign. So it was aimed at younger buyers. And the idea was, you know, you could get your friends to buy like the left suspension and you can get your, your aunts and uncles to buy the engine, engine, right? And then you, you pulled up this money through uh, FCA. And then ultimately, if you had enough people kind of fund your car, you could get yourself a new Dodge Dart. Kind of a cool idea. There's also some other good stuff on the inside. So uh, I think Dodge did a pretty good job with the technology in this car. This one is the Aero Edition, and it's got a lot of nice tech in it. So we've got this big 8.4 inch screen, which looks good. Um, you know, it's got digital gauges, which was a pretty big thing, you know, when this car was new in 2013. Uh, this one's a 2014 model year. And then um, it had some pretty advanced powertrain options too. Why don't you hop in, Brendan, and we'll take this little guy for a spin. Look at that, digital gauges. They actually look really cool. And you can see if I turn the car off, they disappear. And the, the tack and the fuel gauge are analog, but the center screen is all digital. And then you've got this screen, which I believe was 8.4 inches, if I'm not mistaken. And it was pretty advanced, you know, in a small, compact car. That's a good looking little screen for 2012, 2013. And they built this car through 2016, of course. Make sure you go to the 0.5 mode there, Brendan. Um, and then, right, when you consider, you know, the Corolla from 2013, the um, uh, Civic from 2013, basically were naturally aspirated four-cylinders, Dodge then offered this car with not only the Tiger Shark four-cylinder, but this engine. This is the 1.4 multi-air turbo. So you could get your affordable little runabout sedan with turbo power with a dual clutch transmission. This has a six speed dry dual clutch transmission. Now on paper, that's really cool. But the issue is that this car was designed and um, targeted for people that, you know, were on a relatively smaller budget and maybe, you know, weren't going to maintain them up to the standard that a turbocharged engine and a dual clutch transmission would need to be maintained. And these cars were then used for commuting and for driving around town. And honestly, the 1.4 turbo from the 500 Abarth and this uh, dual clutch just didn't hold up very well, especially compared to the uh, the Toyota and the Honda. And then you expect this turbocharged model with the word aero on the back and a dual clutch to be quick, but it has 160 horsepower and 184 pound-feet of torque, which is great in a Fiat 500 Abarth, but when you stick it in a 3,400 pound um, sedan like this, on paper, sounds great. In reality, it's not that quick. And the other thing too is the Abarth is loud and it screams and it's blah, 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 blah. This thing is quiet and you don't hear the turbo and you don't hear all the cool pops out of the exhaust. So it just kind of ends up sounding like any other crummy four cylinder. And then when you really start poking around the interior, everything is just crummy, right? The, the dash layout, the buttons, nothing really feels very good and nothing really lasted that long. So ultimately what you ended up with was a kind of quickly thrown together car based loosely on an Alfa Romeo that doesn't drive like an Alfa Romeo because it is just loose and squidgy with a poor quality interior and then just not very good reliability records. It just didn't have what it takes to, to compete with the Corolla or the, the, the Civic of the time or even like the Elantra. And then it was also pretty expensive, especially if you got the, um, the like the rally trim and or this one, the Arrow. So you ended up paying a lot of money for a, a car that was not very reliable Ultimately, not super fun to drive, not very quick, with good technology, pretty decent room, um, and a pretty hefty price tag. So all of these factors came together and uh, essentially created a flop that was the Dart, which is a shame because what Dodge should have done is really made this um, a cut price charger, in my opinion, and they would have done really well. So if they had taken this 1.4 multi-air and then souped it up, to 180, 200 horsepower, which you could have done, um, and they did do in various abarts in Europe, for example, given it a loud exhaust, lowered the suspension properly, given it a cool body kit, and then stuck the SRT branding on it, I think this could have been really a cool little car, but they didn't go far enough. I believe you could get this engine with the manual, which was fun, but it still was quiet, it still was pretty squishy, and even with some of like the fancier bodywork, it just didn't look very cool. So there's actually another dart at the auction, and Speak of the devil, we were just talking about this. This one is the fairly rare six-speed manual. And look at that cool little shifter they put on it uh, with that like kind of chrome look. This one's all peeled off, unfortunately, but that's really a cool option. The other thing about um, the car we were just driving, that dual clutch, super slow and clunky. So if, if I were shopping for one of these now, I'd definitely look for this rare stick mitt option.
So what I think Dodge should have done, build that halo car that they promised us to be, the Alfa Romeo, the American Alfa Romeo, offered it at a reasonable price, made it more fun to drive than its competition, made it compete with like a Focus ST and that kind of thing, uh, made it a genuine competitor, and then left the pretty good looks, and I think they would have been much better off. Or go the other way make it super reliable, make it super well made, a lot of emphasis toward quality. But this kind of middle ground where it's trying to sort of be fun, but it's not super fun, but you get the compromises of like a performance engine, but none of the advantages, it just didn't work. This is the sad story about a car you should never buy. When Chrysler was bailed out in the late 2000s, part of the government requirements were that they build a cheap car lots of people could afford. Great! The issue is the government said they had to do it incredibly quickly, like ridiculously impossibly quickly. The result was a Dodge Dart, a half-baked under overwhelming Corolla competitor that was marketed as an American Alfa Romeo but drove like soggy potatoes. They even tried to build a sporty one with a turbo and a dual clutch transmission. But what you ended up buying then was a Dodge built on an Alfa Romeo platform with an engine from a Fiat assembled in Illinois and a transmission that didn't really work right even when new. Well guys, let me know what you think of the Dodge Dart in the comment section below. A big thank you to Brendan behind the camera and we'll see you in the next video.